Okay, I think we'll get started. So this this uh, talk is about uh, a new method of teaching. It's called uh, flipping the classroom. Uh, before I get into the details of the talk, in fact, there's a lot I wish to convey. Um, so if you have any questions, if it uh, if it's going to block you from uh, continuing with the talk, please, by all means, ask. Otherwise, reserve them to the end. Uh, so our goal as educators is to provide high quality uh, education. So we have both parties here. I see faculty, I see students. OK, so let's start the talk with what I'll call grumbles and groans, because we have a lot of complaints about the way classes are conducted. So let's start with the instructor's uh, outlook. So I'll uh, tell some of my own experiences. So often, an instructor spends some time thinking about how to teach a specific concept. He says, should I teach it this way? Should I teach it that way? And maybe he spends a lot of time animating something. So considerable amount of time is spent. And then he comes with a sprint in his leg to uh, share his uh, excitement with the students. But then what does he see in a class? Out of a class of 100, how many do you think are present? 30, 40, of which maybe 10 are already dozing, others are sleepy-eyed, and somehow it just kills the excitement. So that is one of the complaints which many of the instructors have. So from the audience, any of the instructors, you can share any other complaint? Hmm? No? You're all happy. <laughs> Quite happy with the way classes are organized. Huh? Too, many Too many complaints, they don't even want to start. What about the students? What is your wish list? If not complaints, how would you like a class to be? Discussion. Just share two. Discussion. You like a lot of discussion and, in the and, class. Uh, so coursework should be guided by the discussion that happens in class, so that is one Thing. You think that doesn't happen right now? Or? Uh, so, a few courses it happened. Okay, not in all. Course. Okay. So, I would like to see it is more of it. Okay. Any other? One more from the students? Don't feel shy, I mean. Flexible? <laughs> deadlines. <laughs> Flexible deadlines where you can work whenever you want. Okay, so, so the reality is, I, I mean, I'm coming more from the instructor's perspective, which is uh, translates into some aspects of it translate into the student's perspective also. So the reality is we are now having to deal with very large class sizes, especially the undergraduate level, it has hit 100. Uh, even at the postgraduate level, some of the courses, it's uh, exceeding 100. So basically, we have very large class sizes. So what this translates to is there's a lot of difficulty in giving personalized attention. So especially when you want to have something like a lot of discussion where you pose questions, you want students to give their feedback, you can only target a select few students. You really cannot involve everyone as part of the discussion. And often there will be few active students who hog all the attention. Right? So that typically happens. And there is also the problem that you can't give enough think time for weaker students to solve a subtle problem. Maybe they need 30 minutes or they, maybe they need 20 minutes. You can't really pause the class and, I mean, you have to cover certain amount of material in the class. So you really cannot give enough time for the weaker students. And this discussion also, there's only so much questions you can ask because, again, there is a specific time limit. You need to convey certain amount of information. So you can't have a free-for-all discussion and going on. So these are some of the problems that we face in the large class sizes. Another problem, which uh, is this problem of poor attendance. So there is a mismatch between students' waking hours and class timings. So 8.30 class is like lot of groans. I mean, it's uh, even I personally can uh, relate to them because I also hate the 8.30 classes. And what happens often is once a lecture or two is skipped, which becomes inevitable because you get involved in so many other activities, 
catch up is not easy and that's at least what the students think i mean if you are really dedicated i'm sure catch up is not that difficult but once you skip then that cycle continues you just tend to skip because you don't know what has happened earlier you can't follow what's happening right now so this is again something that happens so the question that this talk is going to address is how should one conduct classes so as to facilitate effective learning specifically will deal with large classes as well as the problem of poor attendance so the solution this flipped classroom has been gaining traction in recent years so the idea here is basically you flip a traditional classroom so what happens in a traditional classroom is the instructor lectures and then the students go home do the homework and then again come back to uh, listen to the lecture in a flipped classroom it is the opposite so you watch lectures outside the classroom so these are basically videos which student watch at their own uh, uh, pace and time and in the classroom there is an activity that happens so this could be solving some problems discussion whatever it is so it has basically flipped so that's the basic idea now when it comes to executing flipped classroom each instructor has their own ideas and how to go about it so what i'm going to uh, walk through henceforth is i'm going to present a case study of a ug course which i had conducted using the flipped classroom model so this had about 95 students the course is uh, computer networks which is a third year undergrad course this is a compulsory course so that's why the registration is high so here is the outline of the talk so as an instructor i had certain objectives that need to to be met as part of this flipped classroom model so i'll uh, state what these objectives are and then i'll tell how i went about implementing these objectives then i'll also show a demo of the platform that i have used for conducting this flipped classroom uh, naturally since this was an experiment i did a very detailed student survey i'll present some results from the survey i'll also share with you some of the insights i had gained as part of conducting this particular class and then i'll talk about some ultimate vision i have in this space so that's the outline so here are the main objects so naturally when you are moving instruction outside the classroom setting so whatever you want to teach is now going to happen via the video so the goal is you should mimic in classroom settings as much as possible so what happens in a classroom setting there's a lot of discussion as mentioned you ask questions students respond you tell something so that same setting to the extent possible you want to capture it so what this translates to is the videos that you want the students to watch have to be very interactive so for that you need to embed questions activities as part of the videos and when someone solves a question you need to provide feedback to the students also as to oh you may have missed something like this that's why your answer is wrong some kind of feedback has to be given so the way students proceed is they watch they pause they think understand answer and then again continue so that's the way in which the instruction happens the second objective i had is you have to retain student focus so in a traditional classroom setting if some student is playing angry birds on his smartphone i can just confiscate the smartphone or kick him out of the class whereas here there's no control i mean i don't know what he is doing he may be playing uh, he may watch uh, one slide and then go ahead play some game come back so you really need to retain students focus when he is watching so for that naturally exciting material is the way to go and but it's often not always feasible the next best thing you could do is to keep the video short and sweet anything about 20 minutes students tend to get distracted so you need to keep it simple in fact many have requested to keep under 10 minutes but that's a bit of a i mean you really can't convey much another objective which i had in mind is this provide complete learning so again in a typical classroom setting you tell something which can span multiple lectures and then there is an activity either a demo or reference material which all happens outside the classroom but in order to learn a concept properly it may be that you you listen to something and then maybe you do a demo of it then come back and continue so that will give you a better understanding of that particular concept so you basically want interspersed video viewing as well as study time where you reference this material do some practice problems do a demo whatever it is so you move ahead only after mastering a concept so you want to provide this complete learning as well so in order to achieve these three objectives that i have listed 
what it has resulted in is what I call a multimedia textbook that is going to be hosted on a web platform. So what you do here is in a regular textbook, if you see there are chapters, there are sections, there are review problems, practice problems, so on and so forth. It's the same idea except that instead of text, you now have a video. So what you do is you uh, come up with these concepts, each typically a subject you have many concepts you want to cover. You package these concepts as modules. Typically you try to set the video length less than 20 minutes. If not, you try to split it up. And then you neatly organized all these modules as chapter sections with all the supporting material in one place. So that is what forms a multimedia textbook and this is what you're going to host on a website for the students to reference. So that's outside the classroom setting. What happens inside the classroom setting? Again, this is the tutorial portion of it and my objective here is to provide some kind of personalized attention in order to provide some kind of personalized attention, especially if there's a large class, it's a good idea to divide it into smaller groups. So each tutorial should contain no more than 30 students or 35 students, ideally even lesser if possible. And then as part of the tutorial, you need to excite, challenge students, you need to be able to facilitate group learning, discussion, so on and so forth. So some of the discussion aspects which are really not possible to do in the outside classroom setting when you're watching videos, you try to do it inside the classroom. So the end result of these objectives in implementation, it resulted in me dividing the 95 students into groups of 32, three groups, sorry, <laughs> groups of three consisting of 32 and three one hour tutorial slots for the three groups. So each group has one hour tutorial slots, but since I'm managing three groups, there are overall three tutorial uh, slots. So this is the typical weekly plan uh, I followed in running the course. So outside class hours are about five hours, which consist of video time totaling two hours and study time, which is three hours. This is interspersed, so they can do whatever they want, watch video, do practice problem, do a demo, whatever it is that they want. Uh, and then there is a tutorial session for one hour where we meet in small groups of 32, three slots over all the three groups. So one of the first things I do when we meet is there's a five to 10 minute recap quiz just to ensure that they watch the video. It's just a review quiz, just so that they're on top of things. This is followed by discussion, clarification of questions, some practice problems, whatever it is. I'll talk more about what happens in the tutorial in a later slide. And yeah, so you can think of it like the regular slots are three. We have three slots in a week, right? So each slot, I meet a group, one group. I some, yeah, sometimes I meet if I'm conducting a quiz or uh, some such uh, makeup class or something, yeah. So in terms of grading, the way this ran was there were periodic quizzes just to ensure that students stay on top of things, uh, which constituted of weekly tutorial quizzes of 10%, review quizzes every three weeks, and then the remaining grade was made up by the mid-sum and final. This is how the course was organized. <coughs> So outcome of this model is, this is basically the advantages of this particular model is the PFC learning, which I call personalized learning. The P first P stands for personalized learning. So when an, a student is watching a video, it's as if the instructor is talking just to him, so you feel special, hopefully. One very important aspect, which is not possible in a traditional classroom setting, is all get to answer the questions in the video. So in a typical traditional setting, I can only ask you answer this question. I can't target everyone, but here everyone gets to answer the question. So that's something very uh, important. Again, you answer without fear of embarrassment. So mostly UGs are not that shy, but I see a lot of shyness in the MTech students, even though they know the answer, they just keep quiet. So here there is no such fear of embarrassment. You could go ahead, express whatever thoughts you have. And because we are dealing face to face in a small group setting, uh, the focused small group tutorials also give a kind of a personalized feeling. So that is the personalized learning aspect of it. Then there's a flexible learning aspect of it which students loved as you can uh, relate to. So students choice of time, place, group. So they could watch whenever they want, middle of the night, two o'clock, whatever it is. So that's uh, the flexibility and 
Importantly, from a learning's perspective, the student's pace. You can take as much time as you want to solve a problem. So, for example, something like in a classroom setting, if I ask a question, I hardly give one or two minutes for you to give an answer. Here, you take 10 minutes, you take 20 minutes, doesn't really matter till you understand what's happening. So, you can do it at your own pace. And if something is not clear, you can even watch multiple times. And of course, the flexibility, you have to be careful. This can, to some extent, be avoided be due to periodic quizzes. So you really cannot procrastinate watching because you'll be quizzed. And then there is complete learning. Each concept is complete with all the materials. That way, you can intersperse your watching and study time and only move ahead once you master the concept. So this is the outcome of this uh, model. So I'll show you. Uh, a demo of the platform that was used in running this uh, particular course. There were many contributors. All these, the top are all are recently graduated BTEC 4. They've done a fabulous, I'm really proud of them. Um, so now going forward, Mayank Meghwanshi, who is a third year student, uh, our own student, he is, uh, uh, we are working on version 3 now. This course was run on version 1. Version 2, Bhaskar is actually using it to run his uh, course. Sake Choudhury is, in fact, uh, outside the department chemical engineering uh, student who is helping me um, in developing the platform. So let me just show a demo of the platform. So this is the web page. In fact, those two are the guys who had developed this version 1, Saif and Alankar. So this is the course. So you can see there is some description. Uh, Wiki is where I put up the schedule as to who can watch when, what in this week you watch these videos, this week you watch this videos, so on and so forth. So that schedule is put up in there. And here is the organization of the content in the form of, you can view these as chapters. And within, for example, each chapter, these are the sections which cover different concepts. Uh, for example, if you go here, so this has slides. There is a quiz associated with. This is a quiz outside the video because this is a practice quiz. So it asks certain questions. You have, well, <laughs> my uh, when I log in, there are bugs because uh, uh, I try to modify things when I do it. But students don't have such kind of bugs. So here is uh, the video. So I'll just quickly, so as you can see, there are questions as part of it. I don't think there is a sound card here that plays. But as you can see, questions pop up. You have to answer the questions. It's OK. And based on what you answer, it will tell uh, something or the other. So uh, you can give any kind of feedback here, not just correct. So this is how a video looks. And then there is a discussion forum for the students to communicate any questions. A student can also track his progress. So in each chapter, how many points did he score, so on and so forth. And what is interesting, this is another thing that is interesting about, I don't know, they'll blame me for displaying this, but I'll quickly show and uh, take away. So basically what the scoreboard does is it shows how the students, how many problems they have solved and how many points they scored. As you can see, this is, so overall is about 191. 191 is the total number of problems. As you can see, majority, it's unbelievable. I've never thought they'll, they'll do it, but they have in fact, uh, solved problems, many of the problems that I had put up. So that's part of the uh, scoreboard. These are the uh, problems that are outside the quiz. Okay. Hmm. Within the quiz, problems are also there. That, so there are outside ones are more of a uh, testing your understanding of the concept. Inside the quiz, questions are about directing you to the right solution. So they are more like the kind of questions you ask in class for facilitating understanding. So based on, uh, after the running this course, I had done a very detailed survey. In fact, uh, I'm only going to present a subset of the results. I'm happy to uh, share with you the results of the survey if you are interested. So there were 54 respondents, not easy. I had to coax them a lot. 
so the positives, of course, everyone loved the flexibility, convenience, freedom. So these words were peppered all over the good things about the things. So that's what they loved. Another thing which they appreciated is the fact that they could rewatch videos. Some watch two, three times. So they watch once before the quiz, before the midsum. They in fact again watch. In fact, they had a marathon of watching uh, all the videos just before any exam. Uh, they also liked the fact that they had small tutorial groups where they could get more attention. Another thing they really appreciated is this outside the video quizzes where you solve these problems and you get instant feedback. You solve something, it tells you whether it's correct or wrong. So that's something, there's some kind of a competition in like kind of trying to solve all this problem, who came first. The scoreboard, as you see, many of them attempted it because the first few people got a treat from me if, uh, each periodically. So there was some kind of competition to be at the top of the scoreboard. Okay. So this flipped classroom model is no magic wand that will make every problem disappear. It has, in fact, a few negatives. Uh, one major complaint, in fact, this again is something that is there all over the uh, survey form. No immediate feedback. Basically, doubts are not cleared right away. So you are watching the video. Uh, you have some question. You really cannot get it clarified right then and there. You really have to wait for the tutorial to get it clarified, or you can initiate a discussion forum, something, but it's not an instantaneous feedback. This is something which many people did not like. Uh, no easy solutions for this, but there are three solutions that are feasible. One I would call is an instructor watch. Basically, you specify a designated time during the week where you are available. These are like office hours, say. You are there. You assemble in a class. They all watch and whatever questions they have, they can come get instant feedback. This needs some kind of discipline. Uh, I offered this uh, rather a bit after the midsem, but no one really, even though they had a lot of complaints about it, they really didn't take up this offer. Uh, so that's one. So the other thing which instant, again, is not an instant solution, but as people watch, they can actually tag the videos that this portion of the video was not clear to me. And as more and more people tag, I can redo the video or provide explanation at that particular point. So over time, you can really, uh, maybe two, three years down the lane, after sufficient batches go through it, maybe the quality of the video itself can be improved to an extent where the confusion or clarification needed will be quite less. So that is the second solution. The third solution is, which I wish they did, is group watching. Four or five st uh, students should come together, watch. And this peer-to-peer -peer discussion that results, I think there's a lot of learning to be had when you do that peer-to-peer uh, -peer discussion when you're watching. So that's something I have to see how to encourage them to do this group watching. So that's one uh, negative. The second negative is that the flexibility kills discipline. So there's a lot of last minute watching. So you watch right before the tutorial or just right before the quizzes. So that's why I had very periodic quizzes just to ensure that they were watching uh, continuously. Again, solution is weekly and periodic quizzes. And again, the instructor watch also enforces some kind of uh, discipline on them. OK. This generation, again, has attention deficiency. So uh, it's called the cell phone generation. So, it's, uh, so to address this, short videos, I think, are important. Um, again, group watching or even an instructor watching can help. You can even design technology where you can ensure that they watch. You basically lock down the browser, make it very difficult to exit. You have 10 until you watch. You cannot exit until they reboot the machine or some such thing. Then they are just forced to. <laughs> but I mean, I, so I put a smiley that is not really a solution because I know no one will like it. But uh, <laughs> You can potentially, if you want it, I can provide the technology for that. Another complaint was this reduced discussion in class interaction with the instructor. Tutorials, to the extent possible, I've tried to make them as much um, uh, to facilitate discussion as part of them. But tutorial is something that has to be carefully designed to uh, ensure. Without proper design of tutorials, as I said, that uh, interactivity part can just be killed. So you, I'll talk more about this uh, sometime soon. Some complain that it's really boring to watch videos by self. As I said, group watching is the way to go then if you're finding it boring. 
taking notes, some complaint is difficult because the videos are rather information dense. In 20 minutes, what I cover in a video, typically in a traditional classroom setting, it can range anywhere from one hour to one and a half hours because there are no pauses, there are, there's no writing on the board, there's no looking to see what the feedback is, so on and so forth. So it's, they do tend to be dense. Uh, so here, again, technology can help. Some things which are missing in version one, which have been rectified later, is there, we, uh, there weren't keyboard shortcuts to pause, play, so they had to move the mouse. Uh, but this can be ensured, so you can also make available transcript of videos which you can uh, mark by, uh, highlight by the students. You can make available a note taking annotation tool. So all this, I think technology can easily fix. So here are some of, so those negatives as I said have come out from the students themselves. So, th so in the survey which I've conducted, I asked them what are the three things you hate about this. Uh, model. So they have, so many students replied. I just, uh, so I didn't show you the count of what, so the, what is, uh, the negative may also include the, from the instructor perspective. Yeah, I'll talk, come to the instructor perspective shortly. So I'm just telling the student's perspective, all this is student's perspective. As I said, the first one was the major complaint. Rest of it is very few students, maybe no more than two, three. So that's the thing about it. So in the survey, I also con collected statistics like, uh, did you feel the need for instructor presence for explanation or clarification while watching the video? As you can see, uh, very, I mean, there is a good number who did feel the need for the instructor. So that's one thing to take away. I also asked uh, within video, the quizzes, how many questions did you attempt to solve seriously? Uh, good number did seem to solve it seriously. So within the video quizzes, there is in fact no marking, but outside video, it's a function of attempt. So you do it in first attempt, you get full marks. It's uh, divided by two based on, yeah. So quiz outside video, did this help in overall learning? So majority have said yes, it had significantly helped. Uh, again, approximate time spent on a 20 minute video. So a good number have spent more than uh, 20 minutes. Okay, this is the question which I'm sure everyone wants to see. So if your overall score for this new model of teaching in comparison to the traditional model of teaching, so zero means say they are at the same level. One, two, three means uh, the Philip classroom model is uh, better. Three means best. Uh, the negative means they didn't like it uh, that much. So as you can see, 60, so I've removed this zero, the neutral people. So there are 66% in fa favor versus 28% that were against this model of uh, teaching. So that's the student's perspective. So I'm getting into my perspective. <laughs> so the first offering, I would say, is a step close to baldness. I've lost so much hair. <laughs> Hair as part of it. I've never worked this hard in my life, I should say. The main problem that arose was uh, each concept, which is just a 20 minutes video, if you have to prepare. When I started it, I just had a cache of 10 videos, but overall I had to make some 60, 65 videos. And then I had to do these videos while running the course. And each video takes at least two days. I'm saying two continuous, there's no break. All I'm doing is focusing on the video itself. I haven't done any research last semester. So, so you have to do slides from scratch because there will be some copyright issues. Uh, you also wanted, since you're doing it once, you want to do it the best you can. So I did want to refer, even naturally I may not refer to multiple books when I teach, but since it is going in recording, I just wanted to ensure that I'm doing it properly. So I had to refer to multiple books, really think about what I wanted to present. Then there was a question of recording, editing, and then quizzes generation was another major, every concept I had to put quizzes. As it is generating quizzes for an exam itself takes up so much time. Now here I had to populate every concept with quizzes. So that also uh, uh, took up a good amount of time. Something which I think, uh, which uh, if you do it, you will realize. Sometimes I just found instead of editing a badly recorded video, it was just easier for me to do the recording again instead of uh, a cut paste and uh, do the stuff. So some of the lessons those were learned. 
but hopefully the following offerings, once you put in that effort, the following offerings will be a piece of cake, maybe that will take you a step closer to fatness instead of baldness. Okay, so here is the, both the tutorials, as I said, they are very important component and need very careful design. The first 10-20 minutes definitely you will spend on the quiz to ensure that uh, students have watched the videos and some clarifications of some questions they have. The rest of the time, you should do an activity that excites, challenges students and leads to discussion. And again, this is very course specific. So something you could do is you could motivate a problem uh, and discuss challenges involved in it and leave the solution approaches to the video material. So that may lend itself to certain uh, courses. So within this, you can employ the think, pair, share of Sridhar Iyer. I, I won't get into that model. So basically that facilitates group discussion. If there is a course that has some experiments you could do, but it doesn't have a lab, you could facilitate some hands-on experiments as part of the course where they again will feel quite excited. You could review challenging problems, basically apply concept in a new setting that challenges their understanding. I mean, if some of you have attended the other MOOC's talk, that Archimedes principle he was mentioning, like, I mean, you, you think you understood, but then when you throw a problem, new problem at it, you realize you didn't really understand the concept. So you could uh, post certain such things and do. Uh, there is another model which is employed in uh, flip classroom model. This is called the what summary question. So basically you watch the video, each student is supposed to summarize what he watched uh, and then ask a question in the class. So the time is spent in just discussing some of the questions. Naturally, uh, you, if you ask very lame questions, you don't get credit, but you ask interesting questions, uh, it leads to other discussion. What you do within the tutorial, I think, is custom fit to a set specific uh, course type. So that is something which you have to think carefully before you follow this model. The challenge in tutorial is unprepared students can ruin the tutorial. So basically, you expect them to watch the videos and then your discussion you're initiating is a function that they should know the concept and thereby, for example, you're trying to uh, review a challenging problem. They should know the concept. If they didn't listen to it, if they didn't watch it, then they won't really contribute. So it's very important to assign weightage to preparedness. My quiz there is a result of this, but even this what summary question is also a result of. So some need to do to assign some weightage of the marks to this prepared, uh, that they are prepared to before they come to the tutorial. So that's very important. So face-to-face -face interactions when you're teaching is something very special because facial expressions convey a lot. For example, you teach a subtle concept, you are explaining and everyone says like confused and then suddenly it clicks and you see these oohs and ahs. Like, I mean, it's, it's very gratifying for an instructor to watch those uh, oohs and ahs. Tutorials, as I said, can help to some extent in this case. And another thing is this confused, like if you see confused faces, you know things, people are not getting it. Again, you can tell the same thing in other ways. Still, finally, you know everyone has understood it. Again, these are some of the things it's not, uh, when you push instruction away into the videos, again, these are some things which you're going to miss out. Uh, discussions, to, to some extent, they help, but it's not like a whole lot they can help. So student performance, well, there's just one sample. I, whatever I tell you can easily dismiss it, but still I'll give the data. So if you see, I have taught this course in spring 2009, spring 2012, as well as fall, which is the previous semester. The average marks have increased. Maximum marks have also increased. Number of A's, uh, well, there were max here, the people who scored more than 80 marks out of 100 is about 12. Uh, if you look at it, I don't know what what to make sense of it, but there is, de well, this increase from 9 to 12, maybe it's because I'm teaching it uh, the second time. Uh, I, there are many causes for it. Maybe this batch was great, or maybe I put effort, which I did, or maybe the flipped classroom model really helped. One doesn't know. Uh, but my gut feeling is that this did help to some extent because as I said, if you saw the scoreboard, many students, in fact, 80% uh, of the class has attempted a lot of the practice problems. So it shows that they were trying to learn something uh, as part of the course. And I also spoke with some students and many said that they have watched videos multiple times and uh, it kind of helped them uh, understand the concept better, so on and so forth. 
So, my gut feeling is this increase is likely due to the flipped classroom model, but as I said, one sample does not tell much. So, finally, I guess the question is should I flip or not flip? So, let me put together again both a uh, quick comparison, most of the points I already went through, just flashing it to you. Uh, the flexibility, fixed time, focus, whatever, all those things, I mean, at times we, I feel we go, we bend backward to cater to the students. Students do need to have some discipline, you can only do so much in that regard. So, I won't focus on all that. Learning, let's focus. I think from the learning perspective, as far as the flip model is concerned, the fact that you can watch multiple times, I mean you attend a lecture, not everything goes into your head. I mean typically textbooks help you to revise, but this way you can watch the video multiple times. This I think can help in the learning. Student pace as opposed to the instructor pace, again this is something that can significantly help. Uh, you can ask many questions. When I did a traditional, I could hardly fit in two, three questions in a classroom just because the ensuing discussion, I can't cover much. Whereas here, I can ask many questions. In fact, I love to follow the Socrates model where anything you lead to, you drive up a question and then go it there. So, each video which is 20 minutes can have like 10 questions, 15 questions, whatever it is. If there is a possibility to insert a question, I insert. So, lot of questions were asked. Again, this in typically when you are asking a question, you are target only few students in the class, whereas flip classroom model, every student gets to answer the question. So, that is another ad, uh, advantage. In contrast, I think the traditional model, the immediate feedback is something you cannot, uh, that is something missing in the flipped classroom model. The rest of it, uh, as I said, if you look at focus, uh, in a long one hour or one and a half hour lecture, you may lose focus in the middle. But when you are doing flipped classroom, if you keep it only 10 minutes, 20 minutes, the 10, 20 minutes you can pay a lot of attention and then walk out, do whatever you want, come back and so focus, I do not know. Maybe it is uh, same in uh, either. So, again, this is my take. Uh, there is no strong basis for it. In a given class, what I have often observed is there is 10 percent who are very interested in the subject, there is 40 percent marginally interested, 40 percent will do something to pass and 10 percent are the least bothered, they are just in the system for whatever, maybe their parents ask them to come here or whatever it is there, they don't, they just want to get out. So, who do we cater to? I think for 10 percent who are very interested, I think nothing beats the traditional classroom setting. I think you, if you want to cater to them. I would say go for traditional classroom setting, but a well designed flip classroom is not bad either. It is not like a, a major fall, but for the remaining I personally felt that flip classroom is better both from learning as well as exam prepared, uh, preparation perspective. Okay. So, that is with respect to the flip classroom. As I said, the, I have uh, an ulterior <laughs> motive for doing all this. So, these are the wheels within the wheels. So, IIT B students as such are a privileged lot. We are here, I mean many of the faculty uh, are, uh, I mean great both on the research front as well as the teaching front, they can convey very effectively. But if you compare this with many outside students, the engineering education uh, is really bad. I mean I have talked with many people in mean, many schools, in fact, uh, colleges, the teachers do not even show up. They just learn by themselves and kind of or the recent graduated uh, st uh, students teach the, the next batch. So, it's some, su some such things happen. So, there is definitely a need for good video material for the Indian students, preferably ideally since I am in CSC, the entire CSC curriculum should be prepared with focus on employment skills. Uh, why not textbooks for the same reason why we conduct classes because there is something in the way we tell. So, textbooks are very comprehensive, there is lot of material, you do not know where to focus, where not to focus. So, when you teach uh, in face to face, there is uh, you kind of take the important points and convey. So, that very important. Now, there is CD, Penpital. So, what is it, why cannot you just go with whatever exists? I think in CD Penpital, what I mean, I I have seen some of these videos, but I don't. 
I won't dismiss them outright, but one thing which I feel personally very important is this interactive videos. Videos have to capture as much as possible what happens in a classroom setting. So they have to be made very interactive. And you also need to organize and put together these concepts in a fashion much like a textbook. And another thing which is quite important in an Indian setting is what I would call a playlist feature. So for example, each university will have a different syllabus. Now you want to cater to that syllabus. For example, here I develop many concepts. You can just pull, create a playlist, playlist of syllabus for the different universities and they can pull whatever they want and run that particular course. And material alone as such is not enough. So this is something like when you are writing a textbook, this is as good as writing a textbook, except that it's in a video form. So you have to pay attention to a lot of detail. What question should I ask? When should I ask? What are the kind of feedback I should give to the students? So all that is not something where you just go teach something, you record it and put it up. It doesn't cut it. So the goal is to cater to engineering education material to an average student who wants some skill set to get a job, not do research. So often times when we teach, we try to teach to cater to the research bent mind because we teach all these concepts, subtle issues and all. But I think outside in, I mean, if you're going to outside engineering colleges, they are not much interested in research. I think we should just cater to them achieving some skill set to get a job in that particular um, discipline. So the platform, so what I have shown you is version one. We are right now at version three, version two Baskar is using. But the goal of the platform is the following, to create three interfaces. One interface is what I would call is for the content developers. These are people who create material, the videos, the quizzes, the reference material, and organize it in the form of that multimedia textbook that I'm talking about. And then there are instructors who belong to other colleges or industry which will pull the content to run a course. They are given the opportunity to track student progress, facilitate discussion, uh, do this in-class tutorials. All that uh, will be facilitated by this uh, platform. And then there is a student interface who basically enroll under an instructor. Now there are these edX, Coursera, etc. There are many such platforms that help. So the platform wise, I don't particularly care. I mean, as long as the platform facilitates an interface whereby you can conduct flip classroom models, whether it is edX, course RA and all, it's, it's rather irrelevant. It's not, uh, we started developing the platform because at that time there was no open source. edX wasn't open sourced at that time. So we, we had already had the expertise. We were already in the middle of it. So we continued to develop it. And I also am picky in, some, I wanted certain things done certain way which course array or edX nothing supported. So I wanted uh, my own ideas. So that's, uh, but as I said, platform wise, it's easy to change it. It's not a big deal. I think what is more important is implementation and the content. I think that's where IITB can play a big role as a local facilitator. So this content you are generating has to be custom fit for the Indian market. So I'm saying, I was telling about the syllabus. Syllabus is one such thing. They are not going to create content based on our syllabus. Accent also, which I've heard from others, some of the engineering students do have a problem trying to follow the accent of some of these uh, uh, Americans or Europeans. So that also is something which hopefully our accents are more accessible to them. But if need be, you can always leverage on existing content from any of these places. It's the putting together that is important. The certification trust is the biggest concern. I think since there are resources available in each of these universities, personally, I think it should be pushed to them. Uh, you can, with this blended model, you can leverage all these university resources, labs, face-to-face -face interaction. The groundwork, I feel, is the challenge. Basically, you need an interface between the content developers and the universities because they want some changes to be done or they want certain things done in a certain fashion. This implementation, I think Course RA or edX is not going to do for you. Someone who is here, who understands their needs, who understands uh, what is it that they want, something has to be done here. So I, I'm hoping that this will help in that regard. So IIT's B's role, again, my very personal opinion. So I feel we have a role to play in the following regard. We can develop this content, basically these interactive multimedia books that facilitate this flipped classroom setting. So this can cater both to other universities as well as industry. 
We can also do this teaching workshops where you can train teachers to do this flipped classroom model. Uh, we can help in question paper setting and I don't see any reason why we should restrict our B.Tech to 100 or M.Tech to 100. I mean, we can serve 1000 degrees where all the teaching happens through this thing and they just come here, uh, give the exams and to some extent, I mean, maybe the, uh, you have to see the tutorial part of it is a bit difficult to handle, but uh, to some extent, this can be achieved because the platform definitely facilitates uh, something like that. So, <laughs> cliche, but let's work for a better India. So, teachers, I see quite a few. Please help create multimedia textbooks. I will provide any help you need in that regard, uh, including how to edit, how to, what tools to use. Uh, whatever it is and as I said first time is difficult next time on it will make your life really easy and not only that you are going to help if you are okay with it the content if we give it to other engineering colleges you're really going to help a lot of these students uh, from the students perspective I guess please continue to be our guinea pigs for a few more uh, years provide feedback on this particular model and you can also uh, we are actively often looking for people who can enhance the platform um, so, if you are good coders and want to contribute, most welcome, write to me. I'll, well, more or less that finishes it. I also wanted to mention a few other pieces of work I'm interested in that is again involved in this classroom setting. So, I thought I'll mention those as well. Uh, I think the instructors again will relate to this. 100 students mid sem final when it comes to grading. I don't know about others, but I just hate the constant grind of having to grade uh, 100 papers in a very short time span. And often I notice is that there are definitely design questions which you have to ask, which you cannot grade on automatically. You need manual grading for it. But I also have felt that maybe 40% or even 30% of the questions can be graded automatically. You really don't need an instructor to sit and grade. So all those, that portion, that's with respect to exams. And when you do periodic quizzes, like I was telling you, every class you have to conduct a quiz and there are 100 people to grade overall, it becomes a very tedious. I mean, you're constantly having to force the TAs to grade something or the other and so on and so forth. So the idea with this e-exam is basically whether you can conduct a proctored exam on smartphones. So, uh, so people come to an exam room, they sit with their Akash tablets or smartphones and you push the exam paper and pull the answers. So it's not pure online, so they'll also have a regular paper which they can write. Whatever can be done online, you kind of push it to this particular platform. So uh, that is some work that's happening. There's some wireless challenges there because pushing, pulling happens. If there are 100,000 students or 500 students, then things will collapse. The wireless infrastructure will collapse. Uh, there are also some Android security kind of issues involved. The other thing which, again, I'm working on is this lab grader. So a lot of the CS courses, they have database labs, networks lab, uh, the data structures lab, so on and so forth. So if you want to do a lab uh, course as part of this platform, you do need to provide the requisite infrastructure for that. So most of the time, for example, in networks lab, to set up the environment, I myself have a lot of difficulties. I have to break my head sometimes to set it up. So I cannot even expect the outside to set it up and do the lab. But if I can set up the lab and provide a virtualized environment for them to use, it kind of makes things a uh, lot easy. So when you do that, how do you auto grade? There are virtualization challenges, scalability. Many people are using it, some networking issues using a low bandwidth uh, uh, link. So what do you do about it? So that's another project I'm also looking into. Um, with Akash tablets and smartphones taking over, so there's the energy issues, especially if you're using your Akash tablets to watch my videos or other course videos, they drain your battery uh, within 20 minutes, I think your battery is gone. So what is it that you can do in terms of energy optim optimization? You can do some traffic shaping. The way you design the web page also can play a lot uh, important role in uh, uh, draining the battery and so on. So, so there's some work that's happening in this space as, as well. So with that, I conclude and uh, we can take up any questions.
questions, issues, clarifications before they come to the class or do you ask them to give at the beginning of the class? No, use that watch summary, that model I didn't use. So I think you are referring to that watch summary question kind of a model. Huh? That's not in my mind because huh? I did not sink okay. in. Huh? But uh, the, my concern is that uh, there are 32 students huh? come for the tutorial. Hmm. Now, uh, potentially they could have 32 issues. Yes. How how could how do you uh, if how, how do you clarify? Yeah, and and uh, <laughs> or I thought it is better to organize them before if they come to the class. They give you the feed sure. feedback or their yeah. issues. You can classify them and then only cover those. Sure. So, in so did you do that? Is so okay, let me tell you. To do, as I said, last semester was so busy, I didn't even have the time to think about anything other than the thing. So my tutorials didn't work out like the way I wanted them to work out. I mean, it wasn't, uh, so the uh, outside, the platform wise, I was very happy with the way things have worked out. Tutorial wise, I, I couldn't give enough thought to how to organize the tutorials because I was just swamped with too many things. So the way I organize the tutorial is I didn't do any. So what I've done is I've conducted a quiz. Then I had an open clarification session. So whatever questions they had when watching the videos, that used to eat up 10, 15, at most 20 minutes. And then I used to pose my own challenge to them. So I used to say, okay, you learned about all this. Apply it in this second. Discuss among yourself, figure out whatever is this one. Then I just pick on a few people, ask them to tell what is it that they found out, and then kind of correct. Sometimes they come up with the right answer, sometimes they don't. So it led to that kind of a discussion. So I didn't really organize my, I mean, yeah. Because I, there was, there was a Rick Mazur who came and gave a talk. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, was, he was suggesting, I think, indirectly or directly. This that you give all your audio video lectures yeah. before and then collect the material. Yeah. So I, I tried it. It was not a video. I just gave them notes. Oh. I just asked them to read. I gave them a week's time. Oh. And uh, by Sunday, the class was on Monday, I said by Sunday afternoon you email your questions. And I think it is the 10% who are very much oh. interested oh. because I see them yeah, sitting in the make. first few rows. <laughs> it is only those students who. Uh, ask oh, questions. Yeah. Multiple questions came from those students, yes. and and the, those are only four or five. This class is 120. Ah. So that's so what I'm saying. That prepared weightage. You make 20 percent weightage or 30 percent for the preparedness. Then you will see people putting in their effort. I mean, tutorials uh, are yeah. Uh, sorry, you are asking some questions, but uh, this also should sure. be a chance. Last question is um, uh, when you started this 2009. No, no, mm -hmm. I did it just last. Version 1 was 2009? No. no version 1 the first time. First time, yeah. So, uh, at the beginning of semester, you you found that few students actually were prepared for the tutorials, but as you moved along uh, towards the end or after the mid-sem, you found more students actually watching the tutorial, the videos and coming prepared for the classes? So what happened was originally I didn't insist, there was no quiz as part of the tutorials. So I just used to uh, clarify their questions and uh, uh, initiate some discussion on some uh, problem. So what I found is uh, many people were not watching the videos. So then I introduced the quiz and I said it will account for 10% of your grade. Please change. Things, things definitely because changed. you put in a lot of effort. Two, <laughs> one, for 20 minutes, it is two days work. Yeah. And, and so, then if they don't watch. Yeah, yeah. So they do. It's not that they don't watch. They do watch right before the periodic quiz. So that happens every three weeks. One thing comes, but tutorial they don't come. <laughs> and that, as I said, ruins the tutorial because you're asking something which they should know for the discussion. Exactly. They don't yeah. come prepared. Then it's so a, that was a major problem, which, as I said, I assigned 10 percent. It improved. I wouldn't say significantly improved, but it definitely improved things. There were at least over 32, 10, 15 who would watch it now for the 10% yeah. So how many marks did they get in your quiz, in that, in that preparedness quiz? Yeah, so uh, again, um, 
uh, it's a range. Uh, a good member, I would, I mean, I have to really look at it, but I do think they would have gotten, uh, I think the final marks out of 10 would have ranged from uh, maybe 5 to 10, something like that. So average would be bigger than that. Quite, quite a bit bigger than yeah. Because these are very, these are recall, very simple. If you watch, the answer is there as part of the uh, slides, in fact. You just need to have gone through the slides or gone through the thing. And, just a recall kind of. So probably 75% may be coming to class, having watched. Is that? Uh, Actually, no, not 70. I would say more like 50% will have come to the tutorials having watched, or even less, maybe 40 or 45%. So, Abhiram, the average for the quizzes for the minor course I'm conducting, I have a quiz every week. Uh, that's weighted is 20%. That I uh, based on our feedback. Uh, average uh, for the first quiz was uh, 3.6, second quiz was 3.3, third quiz was uh, out of 5. Which means falling, but it's roughly about 50 to 60 percent average. Uh, I have an interpretation of the question. Then a question. And of course, you can object to my interpretation of the question. Um, one possible interpretation of the positive is that uh, the students are practicing with many questions, many problems, which normally in the traditional uh, kind of thing, you know, they don't do. And uh, that may, in some sense, uh, explain the improvement in the performance. Definitely. Uh, the issue then is uh, normally in the past, people used to try and do this to assignments, solve these problems and submit this kind of thing. And uh, over a period of time, that became difficult basically because of uh, honesty issues. So what are the honesty issues here? For example, you are looking at the number of questions they have uh, attempted. No, so let me be clear. The ones they have done as part of the online web thing is not counted towards grade at all. Right. So that's just out of their own healthy competition as well as preparedness for the exam. That's, they have done it solely out of their own thing because it doesn't count towards grade. I didn't want, I mean, basically you run into a lot of honesty issues there. I mean, who knows who did the assignment or. So the no, ones that are part of the point is maybe some kind of group work <coughs> is already taking place, which would be of course good, highly desirable, in the sense uh, of the numbers that you uh, actually uh, showed here. Maybe three schools have worked together and solved it. <coughs> And uh, I, my survey in fact, although the, 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 they don't get any weightage for it, uh, it would be good if they did that. You're, you're I did a survey, yeah. the survey had been present that. So my survey also questioned them how many are working in groups, that percentage is very small. Majority have worked only individually, group is maybe 5, 6 people or at most 10, very small percentage. Okay, one last question. Uh, so uh, solving more questions, more problems, it the students better and that will make you better performance. Yes. Okay, it could also be that the style of asking the problems or questions. In IIT setting, it is very highly instructor specific. And students have this know how, saying, okay, this professor asks this kind of questions. Yeah. So maybe one way of looking at the effectiveness is for someone else to pose the questions. Mm -hmm. So that familiarity with your style of asking questions. Mm -hmm. And they are getting more family with it. We will not give them an advantage. And then you will get perhaps a better feel for the kind of qualitative improvement. Sure. I think that's a very valid. In fact, the idea was also that, see, now that in networks at least the material is there, I'm hoping going forward, Bhaskar is going to use it, then maybe Varsha will use it, whoever it is, the material is there. So they can put in their own spin to whatever. The material is there, so to make things, so you can collect uh, that kind of statistics. Uh, based on their experiences. Instead of preparing videos from scratch for this purpose, you we were to record your own classroom uh, lectures and uh, test them similarly. Mm -hmm. in your and instead of the tutorial, you get a blend of maybe somewhat advanced classroom that you find the video. Would that make a difference? Would it make a difference? <laughs> See, there are many factors. The fact 
forget about uh, what is it called? You do the traditional style of teaching, but whatever practice problems I have put, let me say I put all the practice problems on this uh, platform, and where they get a lot of practice, would it have improved their learning? Very likely. I mean, where you are, you are not even talking about video-based stuff. It's just make them practice, practice. It's like the JE, whatever trade, trade kind of thing. You made them practice, practice, and uh, it uh, improves your uh, score constantly. So that is a contributor. So in order to really distinguish which is actually contributing to that supposedly the increase, even that is a single, single statistic on what can you make of it. What is contributing to the learning, one really doesn't know. But I, I mean, I personally didn't want the, the general regular recording at all because it's, I wanted the videos to be very interactive. So that concept, that Socrates model or whatever you follow where you ask a lot of questions, you direct them, you guide them to that. That you cannot really capture, like in a regular traditional class Yeah. I mean, you can pop up, but it is a retrofit. It doesn't uh, go smoothly and things like that. So if you want to do it in that, it needs a lot of, as I said, it's like writing a textbook more or less. So yeah. You, but it may increase some marginally, some uh, performance. I mean, the learning may increase to some extent. We use the platform use the recorded videos but populate it with a lot of the quizzes and then see what, I mean, it's a long term thing. Someone has to do the analysis to figure out which is contributing best to their learning. Okay. So, uh, first of all, thanks for all this. This is fantastic. I really appreciate that. Um, I sense a bit of anguish in this tutorial part. And I'm wondering whether we should do flip class with plus plus minus minus. Uh, and, and that's what to do with this tutorial thing. Are we babysitting the students too much? Wait, what would go wrong if you just eliminate the tutorials? And say it's your responsibility to watch these things. I've done my 20 minutes, two days kind of situation. Uh, you come take the exam. I mean, how much are we going to go and go after the student and you know, kind of force them, pop up plays, do this, do this, do this? Is this the right thing to do? <laughs> no, students may have questions. They, they may have to clarify something. No, 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 so no, no, you, you need that person. No, no, most of her. You cannot just leave everything online and ask them. Come there is a class. lot of questioning which happened during the tutorial. No, no, I'm, saying, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. But don't worry about the quiz. If they are not willing to watch, then they don't get to ask questions. Don't, don't prod them. Come to tutorial, ask your questions, I'll answer them, and do this way. Don't do anything extra. Don't, be, don't sense the instructor having a little disappointment about this tutorial and a little bit quickly. That's the tone I got from you. No, you disappointment. Well, then, you know, I, mean, like, this, like, you know, like, you know, I did this and like these guys are not kind of no. doing as much. And I, I mean, like, you know, why are you worried about it? I mean, it's their problem, not your problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, finally, yeah, that's how I uh, be the... The end. See, I mean, uh, so it is true that you could have a tutorial where you come, if you have any questions, I'll clarify. Other than that, like, fact, I don't do anything extra. Right. So that way it can also be done um, in the course. Uh, but at the same time, I, mean, I think it's a personal thing. I get a kick out of uh, <laughs> discussion, I mean, trying to put some challenging things, some discussion, and ensuing uh, whatever uh, and try to make them think along new dimensions and uh, something like that. I mean, it's just a personal uh, thing to see whether what they have learned they are able to apply in a different setting. Just for, I mean, they don't have to show it, they can show it, demonstrate it as part of the exam itself, but it's just that uh, I like the process of the discussion and something which I wanted to see. But is that in India? Yeah, yeah there it probably doesn't. I mean, maybe only clarification is enough. You don't really need to do the extra there. Because for them, anyway, the increase in quality is going to be substantial that this may be just incremental in terms of. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, as I said, research, if you are really trying to motivate them to think out of the box, research kind of a thing, then I agree, all this paraphernalia is needed. We just want them to know something, they apply the concept in a regular setting, provide some skill set so that they can be as network administrators or uh, understand some aspect of network so that they can debug some networking problems. That level of the thing you want to do, 
then it needs a different design. I mean, it's maybe the content is the same, but how you do the rest of the stuff? Maybe you focus more on the hands-on, uh, the lab portion of it. Ma'am, I have uh, two questions. From one from student uh, perspective and another from instructor. Uh, in IIT, all the students stay in hostel and the uh, networks uh, speed is good. Mm -hmm. But in the uh, rest of the college, yes. the students, it's not totally uh, all students stay in hostel. Yeah. So there is one problem is networking. Mm -hmm. Everybody does not have the uh, networking. Mm -hmm. So you, your uh, model is way best. So student needs to log in and they need to uh, watch the video and during uh, watching video, they actually answer the question. So let me answer that, then we'll move on to see. One is, uh, so my videos, again, right now I have done high definition, but you could scale down the videos. It's not going to take up too much. And a lot of these universities do have very high speed internet connection. And I think Professor Parfait can also comment on it. I mean, the most of, I mean, good universities within uh, India, their networking infrastructure is not bad at all. It's, it's pretty good. But if it really comes to it, there is nothing stopping from, this is just a server that we are hosting here. You get into some kind of agreement with the university, just say the server, put it locally, let it be a local area of so may, I, may I just add to what you said? This model is going to be scaled up now. Uh, using the flip classroom model, the offering for the regular students will happen in the next academic year in the final. We are restricting numbers to about 1 to 2 lakhs students only of autonomous college. So I have pulled around the country and talked to the institutions and so on. You are very right that many students who come from outside do not necessarily have a internet connection. And curiously what these colleges are agreeable to do is to reserve specific slots after the regular class hours in the classroom for such groups to view video in groups. And what we have decided to do is, while there will be a central server here, we will be preloading the contacts, particularly the video and the others, so that on a local area network, all the students taking that course from a particular college can watch this. So that is one way of solving And I would like to also comment on the tutorial, uh, Sharad, where your question is valid. Let me put it this way. Everything can be done online anyway. That is what the MOOCs do. But the MOOCs have a very poor completion rate and the MOOCs are not known to have improved the learning. All the studies <coughs> that have been done over large data sets, large number of students, have consistently said that a blended model is a good one. Lot of material online, but a face-to-face -face interaction. The standard <coughs> philosophy is that if in a tutorial setting, in any group setting, if one student asks a question, everybody has benefits in that. Whereas in an individual setting, that student may ask a question on a forum, so it's not necessary that all students will see that answer. And the teacher can select which questions to answer, so that the important points are made. Secondly, a face-to-face -face thing gives you a facility to address two distinct components. In CS101, for example, I used to handle these distinct components differently. Very poor students, I will run a special lecture after <coughs> dinner. And for the smarter students like Water, water. I'll call this bunch of 20 people on a Sunday or something and challenge them with other problems. Now that you cannot do in a normal class. But in a flip classroom model, it permits you to sort of discreetly, without making it clear, address this both the challenging to some people and helping the other people, but because your interaction time increases. So that is the model we are planning. And for the lakhs of students, the plan is that the regular teachers who teach that subject will conduct the tutorials. But they will be trained for four weeks before they conduct uh, such tutorials. So telling them the tutorial problem setting, telling them how to answer questions. See, the problem, as she rightly said, the teachers are so weak in many of these colleges. One question that I was asked when I proposed this trip model in the last workshop, they said, sir, excuse me, but we have never solved IIT-style problems in our life. So if Uday Gaitonde gives thermodynamics problems, which they themselves have never seen in their life, how they will help their students. In most colleges, the average student quality is better than the average teacher quality. And that is a problem. And we propose to try and see that 
basically what we say is the flip classroom model will anyway do something better for the students than what is happening to them today in the larger world. Even in IIT, the observation is that this model has resulted in something better. It said that Professor Kandan has been running a flipped classroom model four times he has run it, fifth time he has run it, this time. This time he uses Akash tablets to conduct online quiz. The quiz is completed in a minute. He started conducting the quiz at the beginning to just ensure that they are studying something. <coughs> but now he runs three or four quizzes in a class, which is possible now because you have an instant feedback. And uh, so I think this is a very exciting thing for possibly making a positive change. And the long uh, uh, lessons have been that uh, using your model of free record as thing, it just doesn't work. The, uh, incidentally, there is a major effort now with a lot of funding to revisit each and every NPTEL course, each and every NPTEL lecture, to break it into modules interspersed with these kind of questions. Precisely her model is being adopted by the nation. A lot of funding is being given with requests made to either the same teachers whose recorded lectures are there or other teachers to help intersperse these things. So that effort will start probably from this. <coughs> My question is related to tutorial itself. So, we have divided 96 students into three groups of 30 groups. Is there any, was there any pattern followed or it's just a no, random it's distribution random. of students' selection? So, how was, how do you think the interaction between the students, among the students in a group? Was it good? So, I mean, I have done, I didn't explain, I did one more thing which uh, was, uh, I, I mean, in fact, the origin is Baskar. He has, has this house system. So you know the Harry Potter, the house where you earn points for your house. There's a sense of pride and so on and so forth. So within a tutorial, as I said, 32 students, let's say uh, four houses or three houses, they be belong to different houses within the thing. And there's equal representation. And when you do this discussion, whatever, you assign house points. Like if someone comes up with an excellent answer, then his house wins X number of points, so on and so forth. Uh, so that was, I mean, I tried following that model, but as I said, this semester, my tutorials need a revisit. I mean, I, I had to, going forward, because I was focusing so much on the content generation, I really couldn't devote as much uh, bandwidth for uh, the tutorial thing. So next offering, I think is when I need to address the tutorial part in its complete completion. So right now I've just divided the class into uh, randomly into the things, assigned them to uh, groups, and there was some kind of competition among them to earn house points for their. So they're, they're going to have some groups which you call houses. Yeah, house, yeah, houses. Yeah. So as of now, how good is the interaction among the students within the tutorial? So again, it's a function of, so if they are well prepared for based on the tutorial, whatever videos they have watched, they do discuss a lot where uh, people are coming up with something where uh, uh, they do discuss and contribute to something meaningfully. But if they don't watch, as I said, it just fizzles because uh, they have no idea what question you are asking and uh, so on and so forth. But uh, more, I mean, Sridhar has experimented with this in the think, pair, share, he has found, I think, CS101 a good amount of interaction. I mean, it has to be handled with care. In other words, the completeness is very important. Before they come, they should have watched. Then I think since they have watched, if you throw exciting material at them, I think they do discuss and uh, do uh, some things. Because especially if you have this house scheme to uh, encourage their or I mean, some <laughs> spirit to participate, then they, they do tend to do. But it's not, a, as I said, I'm going back to share. Sridhar is going to try this with 10,000 teachers in the training program in a film major. So there's think we are share. There's about 40 teachers in each remote center, there will be 450 to 300 remote centers. So we'll get a first time feedback on how this thing works with grown ups. But knowing that majority of teachers are just passed out students from last year, the experience should be mappable on to that way extend it to life. But the main thing is that those universities will accept the final grade from this endeavor as they are beginning. So schools have to do that.
Sir, uh, from instructor point of view, just like there are so many uh, quizzes, so that act, uh, will in increase the overload, uh, workload of the instructor. That uh, that may. Quizzes. All those quizzes. Once you put as a content developer, uh, no, it's automatically available. You have to add in the tutorial class. The tutorial course class, there are no, I mean, as I said, it's a tutorial, you can have a discussion, you're just, it's not a, like a practice problem kind of a thing. I mean, you're told that some concept, and then you extend the concept in some other setting, how would you do it? It's just a discussion, I mean, it's not, and it happens only once every week. It's not that you have to come up with uh, so many more. So what I am saying that uh, there, is, there will be a burden of uh, collect, means correcting the answer series. No, no, no. no, no, no. There is no, there are no uh, uh, questions during the uh, tutorials which are marked towards the grade. No, actually no. So there is a quiz, yeah, a quiz. which is a recall <coughs> quiz based on that. That is carries like in our tutorial there will be like uh, what I mean four simple questions, one liner kind of a thing. So right now grading then uh, for uh, 100 hardly takes uh, 3 hours so the TAs do it. It's not like a... Uh, in IIT there is a facility of TA but rest of the... I mean, no, that is precisely <laughs> why the TA exam or whatever <laughs> may and, help. And in our, our model, most of the evaluation will be uh, online, automatic. Yeah. You can, as I said, put the same things, uh, what is it called, uh, online and online. also do. It's not, because it's a recall, it's very easy to say, as well as great. Does it have limit the kind of questions that can be asked? Recall quiz... No, recall, that's what I'm saying. Recall quizzes are so easy yeah, to set. I mean, it's like a game. Otherwise, uh, you know, the kind of question that you can embed in the tutorial, there's a video. Huh. Is, it, is it that very limited, I mean, closed-ended question online? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is difficult. So as I said, that one is... So in fact, the... Uh, in lot of the quizzes within the video where I am trying to divert, they, I don't even, there is, I'll just say if you were to design, how would you go about it? Think. It's more like a pause point. You pause at this, you think, there is, they come up with a design, there's no grading or anything happening. It's just a pause point for them to think about how would they solve this particular problem. Because you can't grade, I mean, how would you grade a design problem? So that both all to the extent possible, if it's possible to capture as a fixed answer or a multiple choice, I do. Otherwise, I give it as a uh, as a descriptive thing where it's just a pause point for them to think about. And then I explain. Then they compare their own thing with the, what my explanation is. I have two questions. First question about the tutorials. Once again, you mentioned that uh, your uh, tutorial quizzes carry ten percent, review quizzes carry forty percent. And it's an and it's an carry 50%. So all your evaluation is in a what may be called a synchronized mode. Huh. Okay, the students have to come and write it, whether they are ready or not. Huh. So regarding the tutorials, uh, with a batch of 30, was attendance in some way compulsory or made compulsory because of the quizzes? So it was so it's an indirect thing. I mean if yeah, you don't come, you will lose what uh, was the yeah, result? Was, yeah. Where the students all uh, uh, reporting for the tutorial? So majority did. So they do not have to set up, make up uh, tutorial quizzes. <coughs> no, no, I have told them you missed. No that's makeup. It. No makeup. So all the quizzes, all the testing was attended by everybody. Uh, no, not everybody. So they do miss. So it's ten percent. How much cut you want? I mean, they may attend. Uh, maybe they miss two, three quizzes because for whatever reason. Yeah. But let's no. say you give the quiz in the beginning, which is only short answer to be called. Did the students sort of linger with that uh, quiz? No, no. Five minutes, give, collect the papers and... So no discussion of those uh, questions in the quiz? No, no. As I said, it's a very simple... Uh, Never Never yeah. No discussion. No mean. discussion. So you would discuss material which you were interested in or yeah. uh, questions have been posed yeah. by students yeah. earlier, things yeah. like that. Yeah. So some kind of synchronized <laughs> learning, if I may call it, was taking place yeah. during the rest of the program. Yeah. Whether the schools were up to it or not, you yeah. spoke, said something, yeah. and they had to take it at that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that was the question. Uh, the second question, I'll start with a remark. Uh, because it's here. So I uh, keep uh, sort of switching between two extremes. One is uh, I'm in the IIT here, I'll bother about only IIT students. The rest 
so the country can go to heaven. <laughs> the second is the other way. I don't bother about the IIT students because nevertheless they are not paying attention, they are not going to engineering. There are, there are other students outside who are not getting good teachers, who are willing to go into engineering, who do go into engineering, I will keep it to them. So I keep flipping between these things. But I am in the IIT, so they say it. There is one issue which nobody wants to think about because they think it is impossible. We say our students are special. I am not just thinking of BTECs. I am also thinking of MTECs. Most of the time we are worried about BTECs. But it's time to worry more about MTECs too. And many of us are doing that. So our students are special. Can't we expect something more out of them that this business of, uh, you know, uh, mismatch between uh, waking hours and classroom timings and things like that. In other words, it's a question of uh, which is first. Is motivation first or is discipline first? It's not clear that, you know, uh, motivation can be built up without uh, some discipline. You have to start attending a lecture or start even you know, looking up a video. You have to bring yourself up to it. Then only you could get interested or disinterested. Precisely. So in the IIT it seems we are not talking about discipline at all. We have simply resigned ourselves to the fact that the students may not get up at, on time. So if it's a 8.30 class, they will not come. But if it's a 8.30 tutorial, they may come. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so but if I can't imagine the whole uh, semester's uh, classroom work being flipped. I mean, I, I, I don't know whether it will work. Because the students will have to organize their time in some yes, way. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Well, you cannot yeah. work in purely disorganized mode. In fact, mode. yeah. So to a large extent. to be disciplined yeah. in some way. If not self-discipline, some amount of force discipline. Yeah. And if we ignore, we think that you know they are grown-ups. Yeah. And then in some other places we say they are not grown-ups. Yeah. So I think, you know. Yeah, this thing as I said, uh, yeah. Yeah. there's something. Yeah, that is by everyone. Yes. As Shiva said, nobody is grown up. Everyone requires external audit somewhere or the other. Whether it is teacher, I have a student or other I have a question. Uh, I missed the course number. Actually, is it a core course or an elective? No, this is a compulsory course. It's a, course. For, it's a third year compulsory course within a okay. So everyone will be supposed to take it. Yeah. So because my next question was based on this question. Hmm. You've already answered. Had it been an elective, how effective would it be? How uh, what percentage of course drop would you see? Was my question, but it was it is irrelevant. Yeah, it is. So actually, I mean, I don't know if it really answers, but I wanted to mention. So CS348 minors, which Bhaskar uh, is doing based on this model, uh, apparently, again, you have to correct me, is even if you don't do well within this course, the marks don't appear um, in the CTI. So the way students handle a course where the marks count towards the CPI versus where they don't count towards CPI. There is a difference. Because in my class, whatever I've seen, I have seen, again, it could be a batch effect also, but a lot of people in the minors are also very good students. It's not that they are not. They have good uh, CPIs and stuff. Uh, I have seen majority, I was quite happy with this batch. More so, maybe because periodic quizzes or whatever it is. Some slacked off, but they did compensate it by watching the videos or whatever it is. And overall performance, as I said, I have not seen, I mean, in my final, no one till now had scored full. But this batch, at least two people had scored full. I mean, and I said similarly, I mean, overall I felt that they have done better than the previous batches, but I don't know if it's a, because the batch apparently is better. But the same thing I'm, I'm not seeing in his thing. You know, think people are taking it easier because when I mean, you drop it, if you're not doing too well, you can drop it. It doesn't come to the CPI. Yeah. So that that's precisely the very point he's making. Motivation also. Or is like, Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. There are too many things wrong in the system in a way that I can feel uh, it's terrible. The motivation levels, whatever it is. So uh, let me just say that this is. We just take one last question and then those who are we officially ended and then those who want to continue can continue. So we have so there are lots of novelties in this. But would this work if you instead of spending two days to prepare the entire videos? If you just made a transcript of it. In other words, you put out a, 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 text, a, text, a text document 
which contains the material that you have chosen. Plus, very importantly, the uh, questions that you put in there. So, would that work? How, how well would that work? Okay. So the reason I ask this is that uh, in many, many courses, all the way from first year to uh, postgraduate courses, I feel that people don't really follow any textbook at all. Mm. So I say, like, go and read from this. But I am going to teach in my own way. Mm. So if I am going to teach in my own way, does it really matter whether I am going to, does my video experience matter? So does my text experience, is my text experience good enough? So, this is a question you, you know the answer as well as an answer. May I answer this? May I answer that? Actually, even the voice which is most important. <coughs> voice which is most important. There has been statistically proven. So I will tell you, uh, this is a, a, a slight shock to me. I thought that my third eye is what people like. <laughs> it's not true. It's not true. If you look at Khan Academy lectures, they all are without any person. Most of our lectures that we are making are also without personal reading. So what we, what I am planning for example is to have a 30 second, 1 minute clip at the beginning. But rest of all, as if I am teaching, but I am not seeing. So I develop programs for example, using verse call, rather than presenting through programs. So there is a transcript of the audio. And that transcript is a relish talent. But the fact of life is, if there is a video even without a person, people watch it more than they read any class. It's exactly the same way that there is a textbook, people don't read a textbook. Unless, unless it passes. But there are no, but all the experiences without uh, 10 marks, where is at the no, beginning so, of the So the trick is not only the audio is important, audio is important in the context that all the lectures are interact. In fact, 20 minutes lectures are not permitted on the EDX platform. All are advised to have 9 minutes or less. They have done a study over 1 lakh participants, 100,000 participants. And any video larger than 9 minutes is watched for less than 9 minutes. 20 minute and 40 minute videos are watched for 6 minutes only. <laughs> 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 so that's fine. Right. My, my, my uh, submission is like you. So I think the character of the film marks yes. is really important. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Officially, sorry. 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 But can, can I just make one point related to what I mean? <laughs> then, then I should make my point. <laughs> <laughs> See, I think I mean, the point is multimedia. You know, it's not just the uh, yeah. point is what she has as a texture material as well as voice. No, I mean, independent of that. Yeah. So if the character does not prepare just to play it, would it achieve as well? It would achieve some, somewhat better. The voice plus the text. Yeah, and the character is helping the parents. I think that how much that modulation is difficult. But that said, when you talk, you know, there is a lot of modulation. You can be incorporation to modulation. So, for example, you stress certain point and you don't, you, I mean, there is something to be said about the, using the modulation to convey information. So, sometimes when you do, you know, uh, and at so times, uh, <laughs> and also, I mean, I get something which I've tried doing, uh, not uh, evidence I've really tried. I also try to keep it light. In other words, throw in a humor here once yeah. in a while there, just so that it, you know, it's when you're doing something very serious, you just want them to relax and feel oh, this, uh, yeah, some some such thing. All those things tricks can be played as part of the video. How much additional improvement they do? I mean, maybe, I don't know. Like <laughs> a lot. Without any doubt, video and multimedia is, is important. It's not just the modulation. You know, the point is that the sensory model of the way the brain <laughs> works, there are two independent channels. One is a yeah. visual channel and, and one is a textual channel. Yeah. Maybe and you are using both as channels. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can have your face on. You should have your face on. Actually, you are like one person. Okay, I, I mean it has concluded, but uh, I'll, I'll be around for another five minutes after the chat. Huh.